Hello and welcome back to Picks and Portraits. Welcome back to what was formerly known as the Media Graveyard. Uh, still thinking up a better title for the series, but this is where we look back on trends or phenomenons of media's past. Earlier this month, we looked at what I refer to as the golden age of physical media. I define this as the DVD era, so the late 90s through the mid-2000s uh, for a few different reasons. First, advancements in technology made home viewing experiences much closer to the movie theater and how films were presented uh, in their original aspect ratio. Uh, you could get tons of things that hadn't ever been commercially available, especially TV shows, uh, full seasons of TV shows, full series, and the way that content was treated. Uh, great box sets came out full of supplementary material, hours worth of special features. These movies and shows were presented with reverence. A lot of care was put in to how they were released and sold. Uh, now in that video, I admitted this is obviously still a thing, but nowhere near as widespread as it used to be. When asking what happened, <laughs> the move to digital platforms, streaming services like Netflix is the most blatant culprit. However, this period, the 2000s, was also the golden age of media piracy. When accessing pirated media was easier than ever, this had a massive effect on physical media sales and the entertainment industry as a whole. So, in this video, we are going to be heading back into the seedy history of video piracy. Before we get into that though, this and every video on this channel was made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com slash portraits. We don't run ads, uh, no sponsorships, we are 100% viewer supported, and in exchange offer a ton of exclusive videos and series. So if you like what we do and want to help make it happen, please consider supporting us, patreon.com slash portraits. With that plug out of the way, let's get into it. The black market of pirated films has existed pretty much since the medium's birth. Film producer Sigmund Lubin was one of the earliest film pirates. In those early days, films could not be copyrighted, and Lubin exploited this gray area to make duplicates of films produced by the great George Milliers, as well as those made by Thomas Edison Studio. He also staged and sold his own version of the famous Corbett Fitzsimmons fight. This was a landmark boxing match uh, that had become the stuff of legend. The two fighters recreated the fight for a film uh, that is notable for being the first feature-length movie directed by Anna Rector. To capitalize on its popularity, Lubin recreated the fight himself uh, using two railroad workers, I uh, guess hoping no one would be able to tell the difference. Unfortunately, no footage exists of Lubin's fake, uh, just this picture you're seeing here, but apparently it was very obvious and very poorly received. Jumping ahead to the 1970s, you had cases like Woody Wise, a theater manager who collected and resold films that were intended to be junked, thrown away, or Roddy McDowell, the Planet of the Apes star, whose home was raided by the FBI in 1975. They discovered he had over 300 copied movies on film and early video cassette. Uh, McDowell avoided any legal consequences by ratting out other celebrity pirates. Uh, or collectors like Dean Martin and Rock Hudson, as well as Ray Atherton, a well-known pirate who ended up getting charged after the raid. Up until this point, film piracy was cumbersome and reliant on resources or technology that not everybody had access to. The advent and mainstream adoption of home video formats, notably VHS, changed everything. Uh, with new devices like the video cassette recorder, the VCR, suddenly anyone could pirate films. All that was needed was a couple of VCRs, a blank tape, and time, as tapes were copied in real time, so a two hour movie took two hours to duplicate. For piracy, this is one of the faults VHS had. Another was that it was notorious for generation loss, meaning every time a video was copied, the quality declined. Working off of a master copy, you would experience less, but once you started getting into the third or fourth generation, it was very noticeable. This made pirate copies easy to identify, uh, still business boomed. When looking at what made pirate copies appealing, cost is obviously the biggest factor. Early on, a single VHS movie could run you upwards of $80 to $100, even renting was expensive. A pirate could sell a copy for a quarter of that and recoup costs with just a few sales, while consumers could save a ton of money. 
The other plus was that you could get home video copies of newer films that in some cases were still in theaters. As consumer-grade camcorders became smaller and more affordable, it became easier for pirates to simply sit in the movie theater and film the screen. <laughs> this was not the most ideal way to watch a movie. If it was a comedy, you often had audience laughter on the soundtrack, unleveled or uneven recording, and of course, silhouettes of people getting up to use the washroom. Uh, still, <laughs> at the time, you were seeing something at home that normally would not have been released officially for six or more months. Pirated tapes were sold everywhere, flea markets, on the street, even in some video stores, by owners who were either ignorant to the fact that they had dupes or trying to make a little extra money on the side. The film industry responded to the growing black market with a pretty aggressive anti-piracy campaign. Uh, warnings at the beginning of films, threatening fines and jail time became standard on all home video releases. Uh, many news reports at the time featured undercover exposés, uh, promoted scare tactics, connecting video piracy to organized crime and the drug trade. Uh, PSAs were released doing the same thing, even linking piracy to human trafficking. Now, I am not saying organized crime syndicates weren't pushing pirated tapes, but some of these reports literally say that if you buy a pirated movie, you could be helping your kid get on drugs, uh, or worse, which I think is ridiculous. Uh, but they were desperate. <laughs> they were losing a lot of money. Physical piracy continued with the move to DVD. DVD burners were standard in most PCs at the time. They also greatly sped up the process. Instead of taking two hours, a copy could be made in under 30 minutes. However, the biggest advancement in piracy came with the internet. Like VHS had in the 80s, in the 90s the internet radically changed how piracy worked. You no longer needed to go anywhere physically to buy dupes. Uh, I found this great news clip of a story right after the Seinfeld finale, so 1998. It uh, features a guy who is selling copies of uh, outtakes and deleted scenes that was never intended for public viewing. It was leaked by staff, he got a hold of it, and basically made a business out of it. Before DVD special features, there really was no other way to see these sorts of things, and this guy apparently made a killing. Around this time, eBay was full of listings for media that was clearly bootlegged. The most significant change came in 1999 with Napster, a peer-to-peer -peer network that allowed users to share and download media uh, from their own computers. Napster is most associated with music, uh, but really any file can be transferred over it, uh, including video uh, or viruses. This really opened up the floodgates. Napster was shut down and re-emerged as a legitimate service, but as it became easier to digitally rip media, new services like Kazaa or LimeWire emerged. These eventually gave way to BitTorrent, uh, which functioned similarly, but allowed for larger files to be shared. Uh, gone were the days of third or fourth generation copies. You can now download DVD quality versions of films, entire runs of TV shows, uh, basically any video from torrent sites uh, like IsoHunt, uh, or the Pirate Bay. For newer movies, people would leak award screeners, DVD quality versions of films, sometimes still in theaters, that were submitted to film festivals, the Oscars, that sort of thing, uh, all from the comfort of their own home, which 10 years earlier was just unimaginable. How did this cut into the film industry's profits? Well, in 2005, the estimated losses on account of piracy was over $6 billion. Uh, again, they responded. I'm sure millennials and older remember this ad. Uh, you wouldn't steal a car. <laughs> Why steal a movie? Uh, to be honest, not much has really changed since then, uh, but I do think piracy forced the music and film industries to adapt uh, with how they offer the product. Uh, that does not mean that they weren't gutted. Uh, estimated losses today in the film industry range between 40 and 90 billion dollars a year. To tie this into our last video, streaming services often get blamed for killing physical media, and it certainly deserves some of that, but piracy damaged it more. The way media was valued changed. Uh, when you have access to any and everything, it's easy to take it for granted. Uh, now I am not here to condemn uh, or celebrate <laughs> piracy. Uh, there are positives and negatives to it. I personally don't see it going away anytime soon, especially as corporations become less and less consumer friendly and we move in all aspects, but especially entertainment, to a more subscription-based existence. 
Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Let me know what you think. I found some amazing clips for this that I will post in the description, so be sure to check them out. Also, if you want to share your favorite clips and interact with other viewers, be sure to join our Discord. Link also in description. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and again, if you have the means, please consider supporting us, patreon.com slash pixelandportraits, ton of exclusive videos there, uh, or I don't know, pirate it, <laughs> I'm sure there are other avenues of accessing it, uh, but yeah, that's it for me today, as always, thank you so much for interest in this channel, and thanks for watching, see you in the future.